Hello again from Decrypted Tech. Today we're going to take a look at Gigabyte's X79 UD3 motherboard. This is uh, part of their X79 lineup. It's also part of their ultra durable lineup. You're going to have some of the same specifications that you see on their other boards. Of course you get the five year warranty. It's going to be an LGA 2011. You have your 3D power, your 3D BIOS, and of course the usual things. Um, one of the other things that we did notice here is that on this particular model, this includes the F7 BIOS. There was a big stink, uh, you know, kind of big deal on the internet where there was belief that the settings for current protection in the original BIOS and the shipping BIOSes of some of these motherboards were causing uh, over voltage and actually damaging processors. Uh, kind of went around a little bit. We never saw that with any of the systems that we had in even running the older BIOSes, although we did upgrade them all to F7 just to be sure. And Gigabyte does recommend that you make sure that you upgrade as well. If you do pick one up that doesn't have the F7 BIOS, go ahead and get that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, the rest of the box here. Uh, with Gigabyte's new layout, what they've done is they've actually created a little bit of a cleaner look to it. You still get some of the same marketing material, the information, uh, just a little bit more detail on the features that they offer. Their 333, the two ounces of copper, and of course the 3D power, 3D BIOS. And uh, on this particular board, one of the big selling features is going to be four-way SLI. That's something that we'll definitely take a look into uh, once we get this up on the test bench. But other than that, the box is pretty typical. I do uh, like the new layout. And we'll go ahead and take a look and see what's inside the box. All right, opening up the box, what you're going to find is, of course, you know, your usual stuff. And you'll find uh, on top, you're going to find your SLI bridges. There's your typical three-way SLI bridge. You know, very nice. And then, of course, you're also going to have a four-way SLI bridge. This is going to be important, um, and it's a nice part. Gigabyte's always been very good about making sure that these pieces are well made. Um, they're pretty much made out of the same material. It's going to be a PCB that allows better transfer than your standard uh, kind of floppy connector that you see for uh, uh, Crossfire. This is also what you used to get for when you uh, did SLI. They do have a standard floppy SLI bridge if you're just using two cards. You're also going to get your uh, obligatory four SATA 2 cables, your manual, uh, you know, again, it's following the new style that Gigabyte's gone for, your drivers, DVD, and of course they have a multilingual instruction guide as well. A couple of stickers which are nice, and your new IO shield with the padding on the back, uh, which is very similar to what we see with the SUS boards. Still, it's a welcome change. It makes it nice and easy to put this in place without uh, cutting your fingers up. And then, of course, on the bottom, you have your motherboard wrapped in the typical static bag. So we'll go ahead and get this opened up, get the board on the, the table here, and we'll walk around it to see what all the features are. All right, so now we've gotten the board out of its static bag, and we'll just take a look at the basic layout. It's a clean design. It actually follows a similar form factor and similar design to their G1 Assassin II in its layout. It's also only going to have four RAM slots versus the, the eight that we saw on the UD5. This is actually going to give them a little bit more room to space some things out. And again, like we saw on the G1 Assassin 2, your uh, power regulation for your second RAM uh, bank here doesn't have the same level of cooling that we would like to see on this. This still is going to get warm and you can run into some issues with heat if you're water cooling. If you have a nice tall, you know, 120 millimeter uh, air cooler, it's still going to push some air around, but it's still something that you want to be careful of and, and make sure you take into account when you're doing your system build. Looking down here at the bottom, you have your 24 pin ATX connector and you also have right behind it that's going to be your USB 3.0 front panel connector. This is pretty much a standard feature now on almost every board out there but it's still nice to see that it's in there. Again you have your power regulation for your uh, bank of RAM here. It's a nice clean layout. You have your ferrite chokes provide a little bit better you know, uh, quality of, of power going through here. Again you see the same thing here, your solid capacitors and then of course you have cooling directly on the voltage regulation modules. This is nice, it's pretty tall, it's going to be able to pick up quite a bit of airflow if you're air cooling. Uh, unfortunately guys, if you're water cooling, you're going to need to make sure that you have good airflow here. Perhaps get a good, uh, good fan on the back of your case just to make sure that you keep that air moving across here. Your 8 pin auxiliary power connector is a little bit in an awkward position. As you can see, it's, it would be difficult to get it in and get it out. Uh, we do recommend, as with almost any ATX board nowadays, is that you go ahead and get that extension cable and you make sure that you get that in there before you put this inside your case. It's just going to make it much easier to to get this connected to your power supply once you have it in, whether it's going to be a top-mounted or a bottom-mounted power supply. Your uh, fans are over here on the 
uh, left hand side. So you're going to get those. Uh, you have CPU and you also have a system fan here, one on top of the other. This is going to be great for those all-in-one water cooling kits because they're right next to each other. You don't have to worry about stringing your, uh, your uh, power connectors out. Uh, one thing that you, we did notice, and it's kind of a downer on this board, is that you have one fan here, one fan header here over for this side so you can get a ram cooler on this. But if you're going to try and drop a ram cooler on both sides, you're going to lose one or the other of these. Plus, it's also close enough that if you try to use your standard RAM cooler, it's actually going to hit these. So this bank of RAM is going to be left uncooled. Again, you're going to need to make sure that you have some sort of air flowing across it just to keep it cool, especially if you want to do any overclocking with this board. Again, you have your typical socket. We, you know, we've said this before. We like the darker, look, darker metal look that Gigabyte's gone with, and we've seen that from a lot of other motherboard manufacturers. Uh, moving down the board, we come to our peripheral slots. This is one of our favorite parts to talk about. You actually have two full X16 slots. It's going to be slot one and uh, what looks like uh, slot three. So those two slots are going to be full X16 electrical. You can see all of the pinouts. They're going to run that way. They'll run directly off of the CPU. Then you have two other ones. These two here are actually only going to be X8 electrical. So when you're running in, in full four-way SLI, you're going to have two cards that will run at X16 and two cards that will run at X8, which means across the board they're all going to run at X8. At least that's going to be the performance that's going to come through there. SLI, similar to RAID, is going to run at the slowest performance, at the performance level of the slowest card that you have in here. You have two additional X1 slots, and for whatever reason you have an older PCI slot, if you have a, an older audio card or something that you want to throw in there, maybe a TV tuner card. But considering that most of these uh, devices have actually moved to PCIe, there's no reason realistically to use this, especially if you're going to run uh, Quad SLI or Quad Crossfire, this is just going to get in the way. <clears throat> Looking at the bottom of the board, of course you have your typical headers here, you have your trusted platform module, we've been talking about this one for years. We're not exactly sure why it's there, since you nine times out of ten you cannot purchase a trusted platform uh, module and plug it in here. So it's just sort of a, a, a header that just sits there and hangs out on the board. You have two additional SATA ports that are down here along the bottom. These uh, are meant for front panel SATA according to the, you know, the layout we have on the board here and the diagrams. And other than that, I mean, you really have a, a fairly clean board. You have eight additional SATA ports on the front. They're the 90 degree angle. These two over here are going to be your SATA 6. You have two, uh, four SATA 2. And then, of course, you have Gigabyte's G SATA, which is over here on the, on the far right, the gray ones. And that uh, you know, covers your, your SATA ports. And again, you just have quite a bit. There are a lot of people now that are making use of these. They're just dropping in. Uh, Especially with SSDs, I've seen people running SSDs as cache. They run them, especially we actually do that. with a, We have a 40 gig SSD that we use for cache just for Photoshop and Premiere and After Effects applications. I want to take a quick look at the heatsink here. One of the things that you, uh, it's very difficult to see, but if we can get uh, a good look in here, what you'll see is that the heatsink in here, let's see if we can get that angled in right, it's got a nice lip here. That's going to allow any air coming off of the CPU to get up underneath and it's actually going to provide a little bit better and more efficient cooling for your uh, MCP, your X79 chipset that you have here. This is actually a pretty cool design in that it doesn't increase the size of the heat sink vertically but allows you to get much better cooling by extending it horizontally and extending these fins out. You're now getting twice the amount of cooling off of this as you would if it was just a flat mounted heat sink. These fins down here are going to do a fairly good job, but this also allows it to pull this out into this extension here and just maintain much better cooling on the actual chipset itself. So looking at the, uh, our final piece here, we want to do, we want to take a look at the I.O. ports on it. Of course, uh, Gigabyte's always been good about giving you some extra USB 3.0 ports. They like to throw in the USB 2.0. They've moved to a little bit different color scheme. Your traditional color scheme on most boards is going to be black for your USB 2.0, blue for your 3.0. And Gigabyte will follow that for the 3.0, but they've moved to red uh, connectors for their USB 2.0 and red for their LAN port. It's kind of neat, gives it a little bit of extra style. They've also uh, maintained the coaxial out for your digital, uh, your Sony proprietary digital interface, the SPDIF out, as well as optical. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know of that many amplifiers or that many televisions that would use this or many op many hardware devices that are actually going to use this coaxial. They're either going to be optical or they're going to be the traditional analog. Well that wraps up our uh, quick walk around of the Gigabyte X79 UD3. We're going to go ahead and get this up on our test bench, drop in our 3960 and see what kind of performance we can get out of it. We will try and push this with at least three-way SLI. I don't know if we'll be able to get the full 
quad SLI on it yet. We're, uh, we'll have to see what kind of cards that we can get into the lab. But we will see just exactly what kind of performance we can get out of this, including some overclocking.